Leon, you might be muted. Organizing my Zoom windows. Yeah, now you can hear me <laughs> and see my screen. We can hear you and we can see your screen and your beautiful slides. Yes. Um, yeah, the presentation will be done by me and uh, Henny, uh, but Lodewijk is there to answer questions uh, later on, I hope. Um, I'm going to present uh, uh, an outline on the globalized project, and then Henny is going to dive into the technicalities of the viewer we launched. Um, the globalized project indeed is funded by the Dutch uh, Research Council, uh, yeah, the, yeah. Um, and we are a, a research infrastructure project. Um, that means we're going to build a research infrastructure to do research on a very uh, yeah, special uh, particular material, uh, which is World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage, the archives of the Dutch East India Company that are in the, the, the archives of Dieg, uh, our national archives. And this is more than four kilometers of archival material and more than 25 million um, pages, of which a fraction is scanned. Um, so when the announcement was uh, mentioned, 25 million, well, that's a bit much. Maybe we get there. Uh, when, when a pipeline is uh, is re ready, um, though we only only look at five million uh, scans of those, uh, the sent letters and reports that were sent from the Indies uh, or uh, uh, Asia back to Batavia, uh, Jakarta nowadays, uh, of which copies were sent back to the Dutch Republic, uh, telling about uh, administrative uh, things, uh, um, the production of uh, commodities or anything else that happened and had to be reported to uh, the Dutch Republic. Um, doing this, we uh, hope to provide a new perspective on yeah, the idea that the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, was much more than just a trading company. Uh, that was maybe the once the history that was written, that's, uh, the, just a trading company that caused for wealth in the Netherlands, uh, the, that was beneficial for Amsterdam. But nowadays, uh, the idea is uh, this was much more than than that. It was a, a country on its own, with its own bureaucracy, with its own leadership, with its own um, uh, importance in the region, very predominantly on the the, uh, the non-European history as well. And we think we can only do that by uh, taking an integral look at uh, this material. So we look at all of these sent letters and reports, because only then we can uh, show what really happens from these sources. We're going to make these sources researchable. Of course, the archives uh, are already publishing this material as uh, image, but we're going to make the we're going to unlock these materials, um, unlocking at the textual level, but also analyzing these texts and uh, uh, trying to structure a bit what happened in this uh, these reports. Uh, how we do this will become clear later on in this presentation. Um, but it's a, it's a large archive, and um, uh, we're de definitely not only aiming on research alone. Uh, we are, I think we are adhering to open science, so we also want to involve the crowd, citizen scientists, or anyone with an interest in these archives, and that's more people than uh, we might have thought. Um, the reason for this talk, I think, is that, yeah, we launched our uh, HDR viewer, a transcription viewer, two weeks ago, and we hit the press in the Netherlands. It was very nice. At some moment during our launch, uh, we got five queries a second on this infrastructure from all people from Holland that were trying to look if their ancestors were active in the slave trade. Well, that's one perspective you can do on this material. But uh, let's take a look at what else is uh, going to be done in the coming years. Of course, a lot of research already has been done on this material. We're definitely not the first. Um, there are even printed volumes of this, uh, this material uh, published in the, the, the past years. But we know that these were selective. Um, uh, selected publishing on what happens. It's, it's not the, the integral part of this this archive, so we, we we are not entirely sure what the bias is in this material. Uh, what were the selection processes of what was published uh, to the world in research in research projects? And also, due to new uh, technical possibilities, uh, we are very lucky that we have the, the Dutch archives uh, adhering to these, these uh, open standards, and the fact that you don't have to pay to access this material makes that it's, nowadays it's easier to refer back to your original finding place in your archive. Uh, so from these, these mostly traditional research with the traditional uh, source reference with the folio number or an inventory number, we'd like to um, polish this up a bit and maybe give a direct link to the exact point on the scan we derive information from. And of course, we link back to the existing research where possible, because we can use that to check our findings and to further embed and contextualize our findings. So the data comes from the National Archives in the Netherlands. And it's almost 5 million scans that are uh, openly available via IIIF 
uh, image API endpoint. That's very nice. Uh, means that we don't have to take care about the sources. We don't. Uh, it's the archive that's that's our content provider, and we only have to build interpretation on top of this. In total, they have this organized in almost seven thousand inventory numbers, which is a arbitrary but also very traditional way of organizing your archive. And they give a bit of metadata with these inventory numbers, like uh, a title or a date, uh, usually a first date of the first letter that is in this inventory book that you can see in the top right on this, uh, this slide. Um, that's uh, maybe not enough uh, for us. Um, we get this in the encoded archival description, uh, XML format, uh, very structured, has it all. And in future, the archives are going to publish the data as linked open data in the records and context ontology. But uh, they still do that on the level of the inventory book. And the inventory can, can then be seen as the record set, a collection of individual reports, letters, or anything that is bound together uh, by uh, the, the maker of this, uh, this material. And that's what, that's what forms the inventory number. But for us, it's important to go one level deeper and look at the more granular level of the, the document itself. Um, for instance, uh, one letter. Uh, that was sent on a uh, on a date, uh, written by someone, written on a place, and uh, maybe with a, a, a small description or uh, the title that was used in the in the, in the letter. And further on in the project, we want to add to this the entities that were mentioned in the document. And further on, what happened to these entities? Then uh, this document level be will become our new code hanger, our new linking pin to. Uh, structure this information a bit more and uh, of course we feed this back to the archive as this is a, a more granular level to the uh, metadata they already have so at this moment we work with triple f presentation manifest on the inventory level but uh, gradually we are, we're uh, trying to come up with a way to do this for documents individually um those uh, scans have to be processed as well. Um, we want to know uh, what the text is on these scans, what is written on there. So we have to make these scans machine readable, uh, the, get text from these. And uh, we use the Logi pipeline, uh, an in-house uh, developed at the Institute, the Humanities Cluster, where the, the project is also based, a developed HDR pipeline, open source, free to try. Um, that does... Uh, uh, Pretty good layout recognition, uh, which is important for us so that we can separate paragraphs, as you can see here, uh, from marginalia. We saw that uh, uh, sometimes it, this confuses the, the line uh, detection so that bits of text from the, the marginalia bleed into the text of the paragraph. It makes it uh, very hard to process uh, with the computer, with the natural language processing techniques, for instance. Um, and it's also handy to know what the header is on the, on the page or the page number, because these are cues that can help us in segmenting these documents. Uh, it can also serve as a way to uh, cross-reference within these documents. These bits that are then recognized by this layout recognition are fed into a text recognition part of this pipeline. And uh, for this, we use a, a generic model with archival material from the Netherlands and uh, more that's available. But we add a bit of our own ground truth to to uh, a bit uh, to train the model a bit on, on what it sees, what is very uh, typical of our material, uh, and yeah, we achieve a, a relatively low character error rate, and the quality is uh, very good um, for uh, a computer recognition. The output of this is uh, the well-known page XML, the same format that uh, can also be exported in uh, Transcribus. And uh, the example here on the bottom right, you can see the, the coordinates on the individual word level. So we, we know where each word is on the scan. So more statistics, and this is the material that is, can be found in the transcription viewer, uh, the material we released uh, in spring, and, and soon we'll have an improved version, um, is that we have a bit more than 1 billion words, uh, things that are separated by a space. But if you do a bit of filtering and, and throw out the garbage or the, the single character words uh, the, uh, and all the punctuation, uh, you get to almost 700 million tokens, of which almost 15 million are unique. And so it gives an uh, idea on the size of this material. Textual data can already be downloaded. Uh, so what you can see in the viewer as uh, plain text. And we soon we will release uh, the improved version of the page XML, uh, as well as the models that uh, created them. So uh, stay tuned. 
Additionally, um, we also have visual material from the archives and uh, an epileptic warning on this, uh, this slide. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, something we tried this, uh, this spring as well in a, a little hackathon, um, because the National Archives also hosts a collection of colonial maps. And uh, not only the National Archives, we discovered, also our own uh, university library of the University of Amsterdam uh, have a huge map collection, a colonial map collection, that they both offer in this IIIF uh, image API standard. So very easy for us to make uh, manifests out of this and feed it into the brilliant all maps tool to georeference those. Here in the bottom right, you can see what we did in just an afternoon. We georeferenced more than 50 maps on the world map. And now these can serve as a background layer for our data when we link something to a location or serve uh, as input for a next step, uh, a computer vision step, in which we look at which icons and other uh, iconography is used on these maps to, um, um, apart from a textual representation, um, say something about uh, uh, places, uh, settlements of the VOC, maybe indicated with a flag or fortresses, a uh, collection of, uh, of trees indicate a forest or shallowness in the sea that was important for ships. Um, we there focused on these visual elements because we think that the text can very well be recognized with the machine reading maps tool uh, toolkit uh, developed at the Turing Institute. So this is uh, future work, uh, work in progress. Uh, but can provide yet another perspective to these textual sources on how the early modern world looked like, um, especially before British colonization uh, took off. But let's go back to the text and have an example of what we then beyond text, just uh, offering text, do with this material. Um, we have two uh, work packages, two teams in, uh, in the project. Uh, one of it is a historical contextualization team. And um, until now, they have looked at these secondary sources and made used lists, huge lists of uh, all the polities that are uh, uh, described in secondary literature, or all the places that are already gathered by other data sets, or uh, names of ships, so that we have a, a, a database uh, to start with uh, and to link to once we start annotating this textual material. Um, but it's a two-way two process. Additionally, once annotating this material, probably new entities will pop up uh, that are not yet described in these secondary sources. And also these new entities, these new fi findings, have to be given a place in our infrastructure. So on this slide in blue, you can see a reference to Formosa, the current Taiwan. Um, and uh, we say and we link it to our uh, knowledge base, uh, Taiwan, and probably with a link to Wikidata eventually. Um, or we link to uh, a unit of measurement in our thesaurus in SCOS, or white in another thesaurus, uh, the AAT, for instance. Um, so this is a step uh, to, to take inventory of what are the things that are mentioned, just mentioned in these sources. And that's already a lot that you can, uh, if you reverse this, look at all the occurrences of maybe a single person or a single ship. It's a huge benefit and, and adds an extra semantic layer on top of what you could already do with clever uh, regular expressions or other search terms. But this is not enough and not ambitious enough. We go one step further and we try to um, uh, add to the system what happens to these entities, how they are described, in which events they are described. Uh, for instance, if there's talked about a, a suiker plantage, uh, planting sugar, then uh, we expect that this happens at a location. Um, and that something is planted and that someone is planting the stuff. Or if something is sent for Zonden, then we expect that it was sent from a location to a location by someone and the thing that has been sent, including a content. So this is a way to uh, link these entities that were otherwise just mentioned on the page um, and, and further contextualize them. So what happened to these? Um, with all kinds of inference uh, and... Um, uh, linking in the end, because uh, if we do this on the entirety of the material, we have a lot of uh, information to process. But giving this extra uh, uh, point, uh, this extra information on which you can search, can be a huge benefit for research. And this is a slide with a lot of text, but many of this I've already touched upon. Uh, we are interested in all kinds of entities that are just mentioned in these sources, like polities or places, persons, ships. Uh, more na natural political events or um, commodities that we have in our thesaurus. 
Um, and then with these events layer, with our dedicated event ontology, we try to contextualize them further. So what happened to them? In what relation were they mentioned? Uh, what are they doing? Um, doing this, we find it important that you can always check our results, that you can always go back to the source. And these uh, these open building blocks like AAAF, uh, a unique uh, uh, standardized way of referencing to the material gives us um, uh, the means to do so. Then uh, we should indicate if it was a primary source or if the thing was already mentioned in a secondary source in existing literature. Also, we should report on whether this was done manually or automatically, and if it was done automatically, uh, which model, with what bias, what was the trading material, and what was the probability of recognizing this? Or was it done by an expert from academia, a volunteer, uh, or someone else? Um, reporting on this is the first step in, uh, in publishing the results, I think. Um, and any of the data sets, we, we try to report on its bias, um, uh, of how they were constructed and what their, their contents are. We do this as much uh, as possible with linked open data standards uh, to adhere uh, uh, to further initiatives in GLAM. And uh, by linking to other data providers, we also hope that other data providers at some point will link to us. And uh, so we can, can build this network on knowledge on uh, uh, the Dutch East India Company and, uh, and this material. So if you combine all of this in a knowledge graph, it will become possible to ask research questions like, uh, yeah, where and when did the polity conquer another polity? Uh, because this is captured in the events uh, in relation to the entities, or how did patterns of slave trade develop in the, in the Indian Ocean and Indonesian archipelago? Or what commodities were traded? Uh, in which quantities? When, where, by whom, and by what means? Um, and luckily, we have several years to go uh, to do this. But by the end of uh, year five, uh, we should have uh, something working. But uh, let's take a look at the viewer now. Uh, the thing we launched two weeks ago that includes the first um, um, yeah, recognized text on these five million scans. And I think this is, it was ambitious what I showed you, but I think it's very well possible because already if you type in a bit of uh, a queue like het uh, schip de, the ship the, you always expect the name of a ship after this. Yeah, well, there we go, the Eendracht, Silver Leeuw, um, Bovenkerke Polder. Yeah, quite easy. And also for natural language processing, uh, having these cues for sure will be able to recognize ship names. So this will work out. Uh, but we can also look at uh, um, a king from, a koning van. Then we, uh, of course, expect uh, a, a polity or a place name. Yeah, and plenty of material uh, has these koning van Ternate, koning van Bouton, koning van Tombuktu, Tombuku. So you know, this will also work. And, and uh, what we, of course, try to do is also uh, circumvent the existing bias in archives. Uh, so we can search on a uh, slave genaamd, a slave named, um, and uh, make an inventory of uh, uh, slaves and their names. Um, and, and maybe we, we further on in the archives uh, find another occurrence of them and, and try to link them in our knowledge graph. Uh, these are the possibilities uh, that you already have in the viewer. Um, but let's jump at uh, the technical side. Because um, this viewer was developed by um, uh, Henny Brugman and his team from the uh, Humanities Cluster, the institute the project is based at. And he can tell you more about uh, his idea on integrating AAAF and other techniques. And uh, Henny, will you start sharing your screen? Okay, I hope you see my screen now. It should be the same slide that uh, Leon stopped with. That's great. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so we do HDR with the reason to extract text from images. And that's important because text is the main medium that we'd like to use for research. Uh, Images are covered quite well by IIIF, but uh, I'd like to report a bit on how we look at text services, especially because the way we do it is very much inspired by IIIF. Um, I'd like to zoom out a bit 
from globalized because we what we do we try to apply this to other projects as well and in these projects we come across all kinds of complex text formats which usually have a lot of embedded enrichment like uh, uh, xml structure or included tagging one of these formats is the page xml format that uh, leon uh, already presented but there's also other formats in our daily practice like tei xml or even all kinds of varieties of word documents that people bring in uh, and we'd like to clean this up a little bit so we aim for a more uniform approach that helps us in a lot of projects and this approach should be simple should be based on very well-known standards and we like of course like it to be generic to cover as much as possible link data compliant uh, but we also like these formats to be extendable in the sense that it is very easy to Add, add other layers of information at later stages. So, and we'd like to have as less uh, limitations as possible. So not be enforced to use hierarchical structures or uh, use very specific semantic uh, interpretations of uh, uh, the formats that we are using. So what we chose to do is for a sim very simple basic mo model, we try to represent all these texts as a simple stream of, basically as a simple stream of UTF-8 text characters. And all the rest is in our uh, universe. We hope to be able to represent that as standoff web annotations. And this looks a bit like this. So uh, Leon already introduced uh, documents uh, that are composed of uh, typically of multiple pages. Uh, uh, but what we do is we take the texts of the pages and glue them together uh, up to the document level so that we have one stream of characters for a complete document. Uh, and then we maintain references to the beginning and the end of pages uh, in this document text stream. Pages in turn are composed of uh, text blocks, text regions that come from the uh, HGR process in a specific order. Uh, and uh, we have a separate layer for these text regions. Uh, and we also refer to the corresponding text in the document text stream. But at a later stage, you can also have less physical and more project inspired, more uh, uh, logical types of objects that we want to point at, like the events that uh, Leon introduced. And these events also have a text where they occur. At this text, we can also point at that, and it, but this can overlap uh, the boundaries of text regions or even the boundaries of pages uh, and scans. Um, and all these blue lines we represent, uh, all of them as web annotations, with a body and a target. And we typically choose to have links to image fragments and text fragments in the targets and do store uh, more information about what we point at in the body. And this looks a bit like this. So if I look at examples of how text is associated with uh, IIIF images, then I usually come across what's shown on the left. It's a, it's a page scan uh, with targets, it's, it's pointed at targets, uh, and then text is associated with these targets in the body. Uh, I must make a side remark. So this data is from another project that we run. This is the Republic project that is nearing its end stages. So it has a richer, uh, uh, project specific layers added already. And in this case, it's a collection of uh, uh, the resolutions of the Dutch States General in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, and, and we were able there to, for example, point at individual resolutions on pages. So the green boxes are resolutions that we can point at. So these, uh, uh, in the example, you have two green boxes in two columns that together form one resolution. Uh, uh, and we can point at that. 
So on the right, this is the way we represent it. So we have uh, typically we have a web annotation with two image targets that points at the regions on the scan that are part of the resolution in question. And we have one text target that points to a segment in the uh, uh, full text of the book, the yearbook with the resolutions. Uh, and in the body, we have structured metadata. So we have more information there about this specific resolution, the type of resolution, for example, and dates and uh, uh, weekdays, uh, things like that. This is a, a view of the same data that I've shown on the previous slide, but then in our front end, this is an older variety of the text viewer that we also use for Globalize. And what you see on the left is what's very familiar. There's Mirador showing uh, 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 the scan with uh, the resolution highlighted. And in the middle, we see a text panel that shows the text of the scan with uh, highlighted the resolution text uh, uh, shown as part of it. And on the right is a list of all the web annotations that are overlapping uh, with this scan. Uh, and in the globalized variety, it's exactly the same tooling that we use. We see the same setup with a diff bit different uh, but the user interface is, is, has made some progress. We are not there yet, but we made some progress there. And this is uh, this is the globalized version. Um, so how do we retrieve this text? Uh, I have shown the document text, and we uh, we are able to. We need all kinds of segments from this document text. So we did this uh, by uh, implementing a text service, which is analogous to the IIIF image surface. Uh, what this surface does, it provides access to this uh, raw text of documents and any part of it in form of UTF-8 strings. So no uh, markup, tagging, etc. Uh, involved. It is just the text from the, the element that the annotation points at. Um, this text surface, uh, uses a one-dimensional model for the text, uh, it's sequential, and we use numerical coordinates because we want to be able to exactly specify begin and end of the text segment that we want to retrieve. Uh, this also, uh, and we need also these numerical coordinates to be able to compare them because we can in that way decide if annotations are overlapping. And so we can query for overlapping annotations in the sense that they are overlapping in the way they connect to the text. Um, the numbers, we have different varieties. So it could be characters, but we also can count tokens in some cases, or we can count scan lines, uh, um, as we often see in the HDR example. Um, yeah, it's it. I said it's an equivalent of a IIIF image surface. Uh, we can also use resolvable URLs with numerical coordinates to retrieve any part of a text equivalent to parts of images. Uh, we're still struggling a bit with the IIIF presentation part because what we'd like to do is for very complex textual resources, provide nice numerical uh, sequential coordinate systems equivalent of a, a canvas, you could say. But this is complex because we model it as a text as linear, but in principle, it is not linear because we have all kinds of issues of reading order of text blocks on a page. We have uh, difficult things like tables. We have marginalia that are not strictly embedded in the text. Sometimes documents contain translations, notes, footnote, footnotes, page numbers, etc. Uh, the last link is an example of a link to the link to the surface that we implemented, uh, where the last two numbers indicate the begin and end of the text to retrieve. And if you you resolve this URL, you just get the the text uh, of the resolution that was 
that I've shown before in green. Uh, and of course, there are links to the, the, the traditional links to the image parts, the green parts on the previous slide that also resolve. And uh, the final link is a link to the web annotation for the resolution. And this also resolves nicely. Uh, what you get there is uh, JSON LD for the web annotation in question. Uh, and images can, image parts can also be individually retrieved. I switch a bit to the body of the web annotations that we use because, and I, on the left, uh, I show part of this web annotation. It's a standard web annotation, but I've added a few things in red. Uh, because it's JSON LD, we can mix in our own semantics. And in this way, we it, these are web annotations, but we introduce subtypes that can be project specific, like in the example case, the type resolution. And dependent on this type, there can also be specific metadata uh, in the body of the web annotation. Uh, this has nice implications. We can use this metadata uh, using configuration files. We can exactly specify which parts of this metadata are to be indexed for a specific project. And we also automatically use the same configuration to generate a search interface with facets. And this looks a bit like this. This is a, a, the search interface for Republic. So uh, for three of the metadata fields, uh, we have automatically generated uh, user interface elements. So we have some a begin and end date thing, and we have facets for types of resolutions, the proposition type, and for weekdays. But we can automatically configure that based on the body, uh, the bodies of the web annotations that we have. Now, finally, switch back to globalize. Uh, we currently have a number of annotation types defined. Uh, the, the NA file is at the level of the inventory numbers that uh, Leon introduced. And we already have some documents and specific types of documents, the general missives. And we have three things that are more physical, like page, uh, text region on a page, and a text line within a text region. And the last three are derived from page XML. And for each of the elements, we also include the exact image information uh, to this annotation. So exactly store in the web annotation where each text line is. Currently, we have about 5 million pages. If we fully process it, we have fully processed it, and we have about 230 million web annotations. Uh, part, of, part of that is, is used for the current viewer, about, uh, because we, for the moment, we left out the text regions and the text lines. But the data is already there. It's a matter of indexing and fine tuning the user interface. But if once we index the text regions, we are, for example, able to search on much specifically in marginalia or in the main text, because that's a metadata attribute on the text region. And we can, for example, highlight each text line uh, where a hit occurs uh, in an image. Because of these ex extremely large numbers of web annotations, we use uh, an annotation repository that we developed ourselves. It's a full implementation of the W3C web annotation protocol. And we added a number of extra functions like a batch upload. We did authentication authorization. And specifically for text, we also implemented functionality to ask for overlapping queries. Internals are in MongoDB. So my final slide. So where are we aiming at? So this, these ideas about text surfaces and especially about the text coordinates for complex documents are sort of work in progress. And we hope to get that more clear together with other people. And we hope that this may result in some specification or even a standard if that's possible. Uh, we're looking at other types of media to integrate, like audiovisual material, and Leon already showed examples of uh, geographic maps. 
And what I've shown so far is mainly read only, but we also have very much interest in adding annotation functionality for all of the media types that we uh, are dealing with the image, uh, text, but also maps and audiovisual material. Uh, because in the long run, our vision is what I'd like to call a shared annotation space. Um, we share all our information on text and images in the form of annotations on canvases, coordinates for our uh, objects. But these same canvases and coordinates can also be used by external people, uh, by researchers. So people can freely add uh, their own annotations uh, to our collections. And our hope is that this will result in uh, new forms of scholarly interaction. And that's it. I'd like to thank you. And invite to uh, go to our website and uh, subscribe yourself to our newsletter. Uh, there it is. Uh, the big uh, 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 pink button somewhere down left, I think, on the website. Uh, but please reach out to us uh, if you want to know more or uh, now if you have questions uh, or uh, if you want to work uh, with us uh, in a particular project. Um, we'd love to hear your ideas. Wow. Thank you all. This was really fabulous. I don't want to say I was surprised by how <laughs> wonderful and extensive this is, but um, this really exceeded even my imagination. So. Um, I am sure we're going to have questions if folks either want to put them in the meeting chat, if you would like me to read them out, or if you just want to unmute or raise your hand. I'm seeing a lot of wows and impressive works in the, in the chat. Oh. Emma, you want to unmute? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, you both. This was amazing. Um, and I definitely want to schedule you for a more detailed demo for the AI machine learning AAAF community group at some point in the future. I think this would be really great for that group to discuss. Um, but I was wondering, um, and maybe you covered this early on, in which case I apologize, but what your conversations have looked like as far as incorporating this data back into the National Archives manifests or the the sort of finding aids and platform that they have on their side? Um, yeah, we're in very good contact with the National Archives. Um, and one thing we really promised and uh, put into the proposal is that we are going to give them back this uh, new granularity on the document level. So where they end with the record set of the inventory number, uh, we're going to say where a document starts and ends uh, with a reference to the exact scan um, and maybe even more its type uh, and a short introduction and title. Um, this is what they're willing to, I hope, what they're willing to take back, uh, but at least they have the linked data infrastructure for this. Um, um, and, and, um, maybe in the, in the long run, uh, they can think about incorporating more of a material. Everything we do will be open and published in our, uh, our data verses. Uh, that's up to them or others. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll ask a question if I can. Um, so this is a funded project to 26. So what happens afterwards? That's maybe a question for me to answer. Um, so Lodek Petram, I, I was not part of the presentation. I left that to the more uh, technically skilled persons in the in the team, but I I work as the project manager, so this is really a question for me. Um, our institute uh, has committed itself to keeping it uh, alive and online uh, for at least five years after the end of the project. So that's up until the end of 2031. And we hope to be able to at least uh, incorporate the data way way before that, actually within the time sp uh, the time span of our project, either at the, at the National Archives, which of course have a much longer time horizon, they will be around uh, um, well for a very long time, I hope, 
uh, or maybe in a national infrastructure in the Netherlands, um, those infrastructure or an infrastructure like that is available uh, for hosting the data, um, but we're not sure yet in what form. So I can give some guarantee until 2031, but the rest is still to be uh, decided on. Right. Thank you. And maybe I can add from a technical perspective, I already said that we also apply this in the Republic project, but there's a number of more projects. So uh, this, is, this is a kind of a product development that is fed by more than one project. And we hope that this can go on so that we can keep development going. Thanks. Unmute Matthias. Um, hello, greetings from Hamburg. It's dark here already. It will be dark on your end as well very soon. I'm, I'm hugely impressed. So thank you for the presentation. Really, I mean it like I said it. Question, um, do you collaborate with researchers in the field or do you uh, are you anxious that they might be overwhelmed by all the detail level that you can reveal when you, with your user interface in uh, making historical insights, bringing historical insights to, to the surface? Um, I'd like to answer this first, but maybe Leon and uh, Henny will um, add um, their perspectives. Um, yes, we are uh, um, working and interacting uh, very actively with, with researchers. We have uh, uh, what we call a researcher panel, uh, so it's a group of about 20 people from the Netherlands and also about 20 people from overseas, mainly, of course, Asia, the, the areas where uh, the documents are about. So mainly Indonesia, India, um, also someone from Taiwan, Australia is in there, uh, the Philippines. Um, and basically what we ask them is, what would you like to do uh, with this material? What are you doing currently in your research with this material? And we take that as input for uh, what we try to make uh, available. Uh, so how we try to make the material accessible. Um, and this this is in, an interesting uh, interaction. Um, so what we, for example, asked our researcher panel, we basically gave them a number of documents and asked them, okay, can you now please highlight everything that you would find interesting from your research perspective? And they're basically highlighting everything, um, which is nice, <laughs> but not really feasible for us. So we have to, of course, make a selection of what we can and cannot do. Um, so HDR, so making the transcriptions available is the first step. Uh, researchers are generally very happy. They react very positively on, on what we have made available online, although it's, of course, not, I mean, it's not, it's not perfect. Um, so you, but it really makes it easier to search, uh, through the documents. There are a couple of researchers who are a bit more, they say something like, yeah, well, you, um, I've worked so hard to learn, uh, to, to read those, um, handwritings and now all of a sudden everyone can do it. So they seem to be a bit, I don't know, in, in, in sort of, uh, a personal crisis, <laughs> you could almost save from 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 all this material that is now um, searchable online um so this is only the the first step and how they will uh, interact with the entities and events that we try to make available uh in the future we're not sure yet um but we work um as i said we work very actively together with them to make sure that our material will be uh, will be used and that the uptake will be uh, as as high as uh, as possible do you want to add, uh, Leon? Um, yeah, I was a bit uh, uh, surprised. I was a bit skeptical. Uh, we, we planned this meeting uh, the two weeks ago to launch this viewer. Um, and I thought, yeah, what's the deal? It's just text. We could already do this on our laptop. Uh, well, the researcher group, our audience, uh, was not able to do so, apparently. It was it was very enthusiastic that they are finally, they were able to search for a particular ship that they... Uh, that they always chased after in several archives. Um, so it, it's also uh, changed my way of thinking. Um, 
uh, th this is already a lot, uh, but indeed it's challenging to integrate the others, uh, the other parts. And that, yeah, the only way to do this in, is in collaboration with the researcher. Um, many research projects maybe uh, didn't do that in the past, uh, but they should be the first users uh, of this infrastructure. And, and hopefully we can also test it with case studies like that. Uh, and, and if you're a researcher and think we should continue with publishing written parts of the uh, printed parts of this material, that you're probably not the audience. But if you're uh, a bit uh, handy with uh, searching and finding stuff in texts, and, uh, and I'm sure you can make use of our infrastructure. We, sh we should make your life easier, uh, after all. That's uh, our goal. I'm a computer scientist, so I can appreciate what you've done so far. I'm not the historian. Yeah. May I add one little question? How do you deal with uncertainty and stuff you cannot read, but you might think that this is a certain ship going from here to there? Um, do we currently do something? So, Leon, do we do do we currently do something with this? Um, already um, at the HCR model, uh, I think it was in the excerpt in the presentation. There was a a confidence value. So uh, the model uh, gives back the confidence of recognizing a particular text. Uh, it's embedded on that level, but uh, it builds up as we recognize the entities uh, and as we recognize the events and the roles in which these entities uh, play a part. Um, if this is done automatically, then um, that should be made visible. We don't know yet how and how this stacks up, uh, but we'll definitely make sure that if it's validated by a human being, someone of our team or maybe an external researcher, uh, then uh, that this is also um, uh, visible in any interface we will develop. Uh, but for sure, uh, there is a link back to the transcription in the actual uh, documents. So uh, even if the model messed up, uh, you will be able to check it, of course, on an individual level. But um, um, yeah, maybe that's the least we can do. I see two interesting questions in the chat. I'm not the, the, the host, yeah. of course. <laughs> That's okay. Think... I'll read them out loud for you. So the first one we have is, have you explored ways of correcting the HTR text? I imagine the corrections might be difficult with such a sophisticated data model. Do you want to say something about this, Henny? I mean... I don't know if are... I want to say something about it. Maybe Leon, but... Uh, you want to say, Leon, something? Yeah, I, I can say that this is tricky. And um, it, it, if you uh, correct text, um, yeah, on the basis of what? Uh, on the basis of a, a word list uh, that you think is, is most predominant in this material. But then the risk is, and, and that's, that's, that's a uh, main point in this project, uh, that you introduce another kind of bias, a bias that's already integrated in this HCR model, because internally it also makes use of a, a language model. And uh, based on uh, probability, so statistics, it will correct the word, uh, it's more likely to correct the word in, into a more uh, commonly uh, um, uh, seen word in this text than, um, than maybe the word that's actually written there. Um, but the, the, yeah, the, the, these techniques exist, uh, of course, using word lists or even using these large language models, uh, a technique that came up after this project was accepted. Uh, so we didn't take it into account in the um, the phase of writing it, but uh, maybe that is something that we have to consider as another option to uh, access our material. Yeah, and I agree that's tricky because previous experiences that I had with this automatic text correction is that especially for the things that are not so much language, like entities, names and stuff, you typically introduce errors instead of correct them. So. You may do more harm than benefit. Yeah, and once we have annotations in place and we start correcting the the text to which they point, that poses another set of complex questions and uh, and uh, and challenges. So um, it's a good point, but it's difficult. Okay, and then the next question we have here. Um, this might be our last one. On standardizing the text surface model, how much are you wanting to solve this problem for all text documents versus mainly for your particular archive structures? Just wondering if achieving this for all documents could be a rabbit hole that the other standards you mentioned have struggled with as well. 
So, of course, the ambition is to do it uh, for all texts, but um, at least we want to do it for our own projects. Um, but the problem is that to come to this uniform model, you have to do custom work from a specific format, specific texts, document representation to this format. So each 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 format requires work, and that's sometimes kind of complex work uh, because of the complexity in the documents that are already mentioned. Um, but still, it's it's uh, it's already if we do this work, it's already a kind of pivot because we have a lot of tooling both in the, the back end and the front end side that can work with this uh, text model. So we already save a lot of work and uh, uh, and restrict the work that we have to do on each specific text format. And what we do is we talk with other people. There are initiatives going on that also are looking for. Uh, kind of a standard for this type of text model and we talk with them and contribute to their discussions. So we hope that there will be a growing community of people who work with us uh, and that we can work with uh, to solve this widely. Okay, so we have four minutes to the top of the hour. Do we have any last questions? We might be able to fit in one more. If no one else has one, uh, could you say a bit more about uh, named entities, persistent identifiers, and linked open data? It's a big question. I think what we do is all linked open data. Uh, Web annotations are already linked, open data, uh, IIIF is at least compliant with linked data, I would say. And what we are doing with text uh, mimics what IIIF does for images and could also is also very nicely compliant with linked open data. Uh, persistent identifiers. Um, we are aware that linking everything and doing things on basis of linked open data is that makes you very dependent on the persistency of the urls that you use uh, in some cases we explicitly use persistent identifiers like handles or so but in this case uh, yeah we're just aiming for stable urls for the moment and i think there was a third part to your question um, maybe I can add to this. Um, um, so the web annotation level, of course, is on the on the, the what you. It's a layered approach. Uh, we have this text, and on top of that, we have interpretation. It took us very long to come up with an annotation model, but this is what feeds our annotations and what will show up in these web annotations uh, if if it's about uh, something mentioned in the text, um, or if it's about interpreting what kind of structure uh, is on the page. It's also interpretation from a. Um, uh, domain experts or uh, characteristics. Um, but then uh, I, I think uh, we, we, uh, we have the ambition at least to put everything into uh, into a knowledge graph or um, as downloadable, but, but at least everything should be citable with a permanent identifier. And I think this is an institutional issue and that an institute that exists for longer than these five years can take uh, care of these uh, permanent identifiers. So at the moment we're investigating this with the institute. And um, I, I hope that we pick something that is able to um, provide us more than a billion named uh, uh, permanent identifiers, because I, this is what you will, will get when you see all of this data. If you want to give the bodies of these annotations also a unique identifier, but also the observations of these entities and their reconstructions, if we combine multiple observations into our, um, our, our Wikipedia page of a person or of a ship on which a researcher can go and see all the occurrences in the um, with little snippets, uh, maybe from a triple uh, perspective, from where they are mentioned in the sources and what domain experts say about those and what secondary literature says about those. So we really want to become a research hub in that extent. And we can only do that if we have our URI strategy in order, uh, but we're working on this. Um, the named entity part, the recognition, um, if, if that was part of your question, um, 
yeah, for sure, person names and locations, that will be fine. Enough trading data for that. Um, but we need a bit more annotations on the other entity types. Um, but what we discovered that works quite well is taking a multilingual large language model, uh, like uh, like BERT or Roberta, a cross language model. Because apparently a cross language model is, is able to work on our early modern text better than a modern Dutch language model. Although uh, people are now developing large language models for early modern Dutch as well. Uh, so this will become clear in the coming years. Um, but such a model is able to recognize the entities in the text um, and automatically do the annotation procedure, what we previously did manually for trading data. And uh, for the events, a similar model will have to take on these tasks of identifying the, the word that signals what happens, the sending or the, the planting, and linking it to the appropriate entities. Thank you. Okay, we're at one o'clock, so I have to let everyone go. But thank you all so much for your time and for this wonderful presentation. Um, as usual, I will release a recording if anyone wants to share this with their um, their colleagues and other people in the community. Thank you again. Bye, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye.